Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Airedale NHS Foundation Trust annual members meeting. My name is Andrew Gold, and it's my pleasure to host proceedings this afternoon. In attendance, we have governors, colleagues, and members of the public, and I welcome you all here to this event. The numbers present mean this meeting is core. I think it's fair to say that this meeting is somewhat different this year. So the meeting usually takes place in person here at the Trust each July, and those of you who attended last year will remember the vibrancy of that meeting. In the midst of this pandemic, like a lot of things, as with other Trusts, this year's meeting is somewhat different, with colleagues in different offices socially distancing. Nevertheless, we have an obligation under NHS Act 2006 to hold an annual members meeting and we present the trust annual report and accounts and the auditors report on those accounts for the year ending 31st of March 2020. Clearly a lot's happened in the health sector since March 2020. So we also want this opportunity to have a conversation and update you on developments subsequent to that with COVID and all the other implications that have impacted on the NHS. One final thing by way of housekeeping is everyone on the meeting today will be muted. However, there is a facility via the chat facility to ask questions and we do welcome those questions. And as you'll see from the agenda, there's an opportunity at the end to answer those questions. So without further ado, I'll now hand you over to the Trust Chief Executive, Brendan Brown. Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us on a sunny Friday, as the chair has said to the most unusual of uh, annual members meetings, but you are most welcome. Um, bear with us if we have a few technical hitches. We have been delayed in our start because we had some technical difficulties, but we've hopefully resolved those. Um, some of you may have been later joining, but that is down to us. So uh, a further apology from me. So welcome to Airedale. We're pretty unique in our configuration. We're a trust that's got a 700 square mile geograph geographical uh, landscape. We cover uh, areas through from Bingley to Bentham out into East Lancashire. We have a digital footprint that goes from the north um, of, of the country right up under the borders of Morecambe Bay down into Croydon. So we're small but perfectly formed and punching above our weight. You'll see from the slide that that uh, gives us gives you a demonstration of some of the numbers that we've seen. But behind all of these numbers are our people, are you, are your families. Um, it's been a year of two parts. Um, as you all know, we are living, breathing and still in the midst of a global pandemic. But there was a life prior to COVID-19. And what I'll be talking to you about today is some of the um, achievements and indeed some of the challenges that we faced prior to the pandemic. Um, further on uh, in this afternoon's meeting, some of my director colleagues and board members will talk to you uh, about how we have responded. Um, to the global pandemic, to COVID-19, and indeed how you and your families have been supporting us. And that support has been truly outstanding, um, certainly since, well, before, but certainly since this started in March. Um, I think one of the key things I wanted to talk about was the fact that we'd launched a new strategy. So Airedale was known for having a robust strategy that responded to uh, you, our communities, and it was known as Right Care. But we felt that um, it was time for a refresh and we as a board had a view that everything we did, everything we delivered, everything we tried to achieve, all of our ambitions should be aligned to a current strategy. And that was around um, having thriving people and indeed healthy communities. But what we did was take a different approach to developing this strategy. We didn't sit in a darkened room and develop it. We engaged with our colleagues and indeed we engaged with our communities far and wide to come up with five headings. It's commonly known as the five P's and we look predominantly at patients, people, progression, partnership and indeed our population. Um, I'm sure many of you will have other P's that you think we could have added, um, but we stuck to the five at this point. And as a hospital provider um, that covers both acute services and indeed that far reaching community element, um, our focus is always and should always be on our patients. And I think it's important to call out that prior to COVID, the NHS was facing 
some of the biggest challenges that it's ever faced around capacity and money and activity. But we were pleased to see that um, we'd continue to maintain a strong level of performance operationally. Uh, we've detailed um, against the four hour targets of the numbers of patients that we're seeing within that time frame. For us, it isn't just about the time frame and that four hour window. It's absolutely about the experience patients and their families have in our emergency department at what is probably the worst of time. Um, Rob Aitchison will be on the call later, will be on the meeting later and we'll talk to you about some of our planning and reset activities, but uh, the, the NHS always talks about the four hour target, but we're equally focused on what it means for waiting times, what it means for patients and their families waiting for or undergoing cancer treatment. Um, so you will see some of the details recorded here in this slide. And pleasingly, the board um, received a report that detailed that 97 of our 97 percent of our patients um, would recommend our patient would, would sorry I can't get my words out today would recommend our services including our outpatient services um, which was a great boost for us but we're really keen that we maintain that momentum and we're very conscious that we're operating in a different context so whilst that report was great at a moment before time before the pandemic broke uh, we're continually revisiting this to make sure that the services we do offer or the services that you want. Well, on for more patients, you will be wondering why there is a picture of a llama, um, but it's it's very appropriate. It's actually an alpaca, and this again speaks to um, my point just about it can't just be about the numbers. It absolutely has to be about the experience that you or your families are, are, are undergoing. Um, and this uh, the the visit from an alpaca was in response to a patient who'd been here for a long period of time. Um, and it was something that really boosted them, but again, boosted the experience of other patients and indeed our colleagues. Um, you'll see that we talk about the Sunbeam release, and this was something that our maternity services were instrumental in driving forward um, in, in memory of babies that had been lost. So this is something that, um, again, was a very poignant and emotional moment, but something that we were able to do in one of the garden spaces that, again, uh, our colleagues in AGH Solutions had helped develop with our midwifery services. Our diabetic team um, were providing special sessions for people um, from our South Asian community um, who, and again, this was a credit to that team who'd worked tirelessly um, to try and deliver a service that was unique to that community and appropriate to their care. Uh, we'd been named as one of the top uh, CHKS hospitals for safety. Um, this was for the eighth year in a row against a, a, a string of stringent um, indicators and again that was a credit to um, colleagues involved. You'll have noted that I've gone backwards indeed upwards on the slide um, and I was also pleased that we were able to get a second mobile cancer unit albeit in response to um, the pandemic but we launched that last year and again some of you were at the annual members meeting last year we talked to us about just what an incredible service this was for pa cancer patients undergoing treatment and how we could bring chemotherapy treatment closer to home. So we've been able to cure, secure a second bus for a period of time and that's in conjunction with our, our um, partners from Hope for Tomorrow. So a real credit to them. And I'm pleased to say that our facility, our hospital up at Castleberg reopened. Um, it had taken some time to get that facility refurbished um, but I'm incredibly pleased with the results and it's it's an absolute um, superb, spacious, airy facility, um, both for our patients and indeed our colleagues who are working up there. The NHS wouldn't be as successful as it could be or indeed is without its people. And you will have seen over the past several months just how much the country has celebrated and embraced the national treasure that is the NHS. But the NHS is, is, is the people who are working in it and we as a board are very clear that it's our people who make us successful um, and ev to a man and woman in every single department, our colleagues have gone above and beyond certainly over these past couple of months. But as I said, they were doing that before COVID. Um, Airedale's pretty unique in the way um, that we recruit people and indeed in some of the people that we've had here for a number of years, they are truly a pretty tremendous team. But what this details is, is some of those um, successes. Um, from our nursing perspective, we were successful in an international programme referred to as Pathway to Excellence, which will see um, the governance around our uh, nursing management um, 
transcend and um, that will enable some of our ward teams to be involved in some of the senior decision making in the hospital and it's a real coup for those teams they've done they've done a fantastic job our maternity teams were highlighted as providing um, great and good care in the annual survey, uh, survey um, delivered by the CQC and that cannot be underestimated again this is a pivotal moment in people's lives and it's a credit indeed to our maternity teams for that result we did launch um, the rainbow badge and that feels that that was at a point in time to look at some of the diversity of the people um, that work within our NHS across the country and that was looking specifically at our LGBTQ communities but I think it's also important for me to recognise and Joe Harrison will talk about this further down the line about some of the other diversity elements that we've been paying due attention to and it would be remiss of me not to mention at this point um, around the Black Lives Matter movement that in the midst of COVID um, came to the fore internationally and certainly here at EDA what we've the approach we've taken um, is we're in this for the long game what we really what we're really keen to do is to get this right in 2020 for our colleagues identifying within BAME communities and we don't want to homogenize that actually we want to look at um, those specific communities and those specific colleagues and understand their experience both here at work and indeed in their home lives um, but we want to get this right for those colleagues and indeed for the next generation so Joe Harrison will talk to you about that um, as the meeting goes on again and the other thing to call out is uh, there's a group of our international nurses there with me I'm at the back because I think I was probably carrying a little pre-COVID weight at that point um, but they're a great group of individuals who have joined us uh, from India uh, we've had further cohorts join us uh, over the last couple of months in the midst of the pandemic and again I would give credit to these colleagues um, for joining us um, so optimistically and they're, they're a very welcome addition to our nursing teams from a progressive point of view I could go on all afternoon but I won't there are just a few hi um, highlights here and some of it is predominantly based on our digital uh, abilities so we looked at how we record patient observations such as blood pressure pulse and temperature through e-observations using iPad technology and again it's a credit to our ward and departmental teams for how innovative they were in responding um, to that, that new change um, our community teams weren't left out in any of that um, they absolutely grasped the use of um, an electronic patient record via laptops and that was no mean feat considering the geography that they traverse and uh, some of the hills and dales that they have to work within so we had some challenges with reception and with broadband um, but it's a real credit to those community teams who took this in their stride and got on with it uh, many of you will be aware of our um, award-winning digital hub and again they went above and beyond um, within the COVID experience but certainly prior to that um, in looking at new ways of working for um, our patients so for instance Rob will talk to you further down the line about some of the work we've done with our Parkinson's patients but we'll also talk about how the digital care hub was able to keep people at home. Our theatre team launched a website to support patients in coming into hospital again a nerve-wracking experience for many patients when they're undergoing surgery and our theatre teams grasped this and thought about what would that experience truly look like both for patients and their families um, so they were award-winning um, in their endeavours and uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, the foot selfie service that our diabetic foot clinic took, uh, took forward and again credit to that team specifically for our um, Airedale patients. Airedale um, as I've said we're small but perfectly formed but we have always been a system player and by system player what I mean is that we work in partnership um, with several different partners and stakeholders and you will see on the slides um, some of those that I'm referring to um, we're one of six trusts six acute trusts within the West Yorkshire Association of Acute Trusts uh, and Andrew Gold is about to take on the chairman of the Committee in Common for West Yorkshire Association of Acute Trust. Um, but we're also part of a thriving um, integrated care system across West Yorkshire. Um, for the Bradford District and Craven um, system, um, we've been working very closely in collaboration with our commissioning partners, our partners at Bradford Teaching Hospitals and at the Bradford District Care Trust, our voluntary services, our local authority colleagues. They're, they're to name but a few. 
Um, but we've taken that thinking to another level and we've turned this under the, uh, the auspices of Act as One. And the reason we've called out Act as One is because we should be acting as one service for our patients. Um, so that work is ongoing, but um, I'm pleased to say we're part of a forward thinking and very ambitious system um, who, who again have patients at the heart uh, of their thinking. Our colleagues over the hills uh, and up in Harrogate also joined our pathology joint venture in October and that was a welcome addition uh, for um, our joint venture and a welcome addition to those colleagues. And we were also invited to be part of a, a, a learning network um, specifically looking at the challenges that rural district hospitals face and we're very unique in that as I've said we cover a 700 square mile geography um, but actually the urbanality of elements of our services versus the rurality of some of those services gives a unique perspective to the care that we offer and I think the government and the uh, long-term plan that some of you will have remembered pre-COVID talks very specifically about the role of district general hospitals and indeed how we should be best serving those communities. Uh, so I'm pleased to say that we've got a seat at the table uh, and that, that work continues. The population we refer to is indeed you and I'm pleased that we were able to launch what's known as an Attend Anywhere video consultation. It probably mirrors uh, this afternoon's event. This is about how do we deliver video consultations to our patients and indeed their families um, at home. David Crampsey, our medical director, uh, is in the meeting and we'll be talking later alongside direct colleagues. But I know David was um, one of the pioneers um, in how we deliver this service. Um, and it's a different kind of outpatient service for our patients and their families, but one that's been well received. But it's well done to everybody involved because we've got that launched. Uh, Vicky Pickles is uh, here and she and the team have been instrumental in relaunching our charity and you will see the branding that's there. And we've been incredibly, incredibly well supported by our communities. Um, but we were also one of the key players in how in certainly last winter um, in the looking out for our neighbours uh, initiative. And this was something that was set up across West Yorkshire uh, to combat some of the loneliness agenda, which is just huge um, across the piece. Um, but we played a significant part in that, as did our community teams. And again, I'd like to pay credit to them for the work that they did. Um, and unusually, uh, we won a pacer train. So um, earlier this year, um, well, I think it was at the latter part of last year, there were four pacer trains on offer. And uh, I'd like to pay credit to Jodie Hernshaw, who took it upon herself to put a bid in. Uh, and we won one of said pacer trains and it will be delivered at a point in time. And hopefully it will be used um, for our paediatric services. So a great addition uh, to the services that we offer. Looking at um, going back, well, going back to the comment I made about our charitable services, since March 2020, over £50,000 has been raised by you, our local communities. And I and the board can't thank you enough for that. And we've been really keen to ensure that that, is, that, that money is spent on our patients, on their families, and on improving the experience for our colleagues. But it wasn't just about the, the um, cash that donations that we received. We were inundated with incredibly kind gifts uh, that included food for colleagues, um, hand creams because people were getting drier hands from the frequency of hand washing. There were fluids, um, drinks of various guises. I've never seen quite so many Easter eggs in my whole life. Um, I cannot tell you just how grateful we are or underestimate the kindness um, of our community. So we are truly grateful for this. And I know if any of our colleagues were on the line today, they would equally want me to echo that on their behalf. So thank you very much. And as I said, it takes a community for us to be successful. Um, and I think I've laboured the point, but I can't labour it enough. Thank you to each and every one of you for playing your part. We did a piece um, 100 days in because I think it would be easy to just acclimatise to the, the, the world that we're operating in. But we should remember this isn't normal um, and it's important that we keep paying credit to both our communities and indeed our colleagues here at Airdale. So looking forward, because I'm ever optimistic, um, what, does what does the remainder of uh, 20 and, uh, 2020 and 21 hold? 
Partly, who knows? I think let's be realistic about this. You will see that there are further restrictions coming around the lockdown. And some of those announcements have got to be made very rapidly. Um, that's had an impact for our colleagues in the way that they work. Obviously, they've had family commitments, travel commitments. We've had to look at how we've restricted our visiting for patients to ensure that both them and their, and their families are safe. Um, but this is the world that we're operating in. It's, it's unusual and indeed unprecedented for all of us. Amanda Stanford, who's on the line, will equally talk about uh, some of the challenges that we've faced. Um, but we're really keen to continue to support the resilience and well-being of our teams. And one size won't fit all. So this is about how we respond as leaders and how we think differently. And um, because the world that we live in has changed beyond recognition and we want to be as agile and responsive as we possibly can be. Um, but in amongst all of this, we've also been looking at plans for a new build here at the Airedale site. Um, and I'm hoping that there would be support and announcements uh, in the coming months for the potential for a new build here which we feel personally uh, is something that you as the communities we serve, you are owed and you deserve. And we hope that that would help again with some of the economic recovery that we would need to see in this district. Uh, Joe will equally talk about some of the workforce challenges that we've seen, but we've, we've had some great results to some of the campaigns we've run around recruitment and indeed retaining some of our colleagues here. And some of our colleagues, as I've said, have gone above and beyond um, in the face of this pandemic. Um, but some of them have really just put themselves out um, to think very differently about how they work and have very seamlessly transitioned to working in different departments in areas that they would never have normally worked. With them. Again, it is a thank you to them. And on top of all of that, we were 50 this year. Um, so I think um, it was pretty amazing, I think, that every Thursday the country came out and clapped for carers. And we did the final event here um, at Airedale, but um, again, the overwhelming support for us as a trust for the fact that we are 50 years old uh, was monumental. The celebrations we had planned, we weren't quite able to do as we hoped, um, but let's not, I, I can't underestimate just how well supported we were and how our colleagues went above and beyond to try and celebrate that. So it's a thank you to everybody. And at that point, I'm going to move on to the money and hand over to Amy Whitaker, who is our Interim Director of Finance. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Brendan said, I'm Amy Whitaker, Interim Director of Finance. I'm just going to take the next few minutes talking through the key numbers from our 2019-20 um, annual accounts. So you'll firstly see um, a summary of our income and expenditure. Um, in 2019-20, we delivered a surplus position um, of 740,000, which did include a technical adjustment for asset impairment, which um, simplified is basically a valuation, a revaluation of our um, capital assets. Um, this, in this particular instance, it was because we revalued our car parking that cost us was valued less than it actually cost us. Um, so that leaves us with an operating surplus of just under um, 1.8 million. Um, in, within that, we have cash balances of 16.5 million, which is a really strong position um, for NHS Foundation Trust. And it's aligned to our strategy, which was to deliver surpluses over the last few years to enable us to invest further into improving our estates, um, both now and into the future. Um, and our, just to finish off on that slide, our accounts have been audited with an unqualified opinion and Gareth will follow me to talk through the um, auditor's response. OK, thank you. So this uh, slide just shows where our income comes from. So I suppose it won't be a surprise um, to many of you that the majority of our income comes from our clinical commissioning groups in NHS England. Um, and they will they commission directly the services for our patients and represent 84 percent of our total income. Um, of the CCG split, the majority comes from Airedale, Wharfdale and Craven and Bradford District and City CCGs, um, which represents about 80% of our total income. Next year, that will show slightly differently because those CCGs have come together as of the 1st of April 2020. Um, and so going forward, the majority of our income will come from one CCG. Just moving on to expenditure. 
So in terms of our spend, um, again, I'm sure it won't be a surprise, bearing in mind we are a very clinically led service, um, that the majority of our spend is aligned to pay with 71% of um, the, the money we spend going into uh, staffing our services. Um, I think what's key to say around that is that does represent challenges at times when we do have to make savings um, because with 71% of our costs in pay, that means that uh, we do have to think about how we run services differently for whenever we need to deliver efficiencies. Just going a bit into the detail on the workforce split, um, you'll see there the top three are all clinical staffing, so that makes up our medical nursing and then clinical support teams. So just under 80% of our staffing makeup is clinical staffing, with the 20% uh, representing the support and infrastructure, which um, benchmarks very well actually in terms of how we our, how our resources split. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so capital resources, so this shows what we spent in 2019-20 on our building and equipment. So we had a capital plan in 2019-20 of 6.9 million. Um, that was 2.6 million more than the previous year. So it shows our commitment to continue to invest in our estate and our equipment. Um, we actually underspent that by um, 500,000, which was all due to the fact that um, obviously COVID hit us in March. And unfortunately, that meant that we were unable to get some of the deliveries we were expecting. And also, as you'll be aware, construction firms um, did stop working. So we did underspend that, but that will be carried forward into 2020-21. And um, we will continue to invest in the things that we were committed to invest in. I've just broken down where the major areas of our capital expenditure were um, in 2019-20. So we invested 1.8 million in our um, information technology. Um, this was 600,000 more than the previous year um, and aligns to our commitment to improve um, our digital um, capacity. We invested um, 800,000 in car parking, 1.2 million in medical equipment, which was double the value in the previous year. And we spent 1.2 million more on environment, so wards, endoscopy, and theatres in 2019-20 than we did in 1819, taking that to a total of one and a half million. Um, so really keen to invest them um, in our estate throughout 2019-20. Okay, so I'm handing over to Gareth now to talk through the auditor's position. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Gareth Mill, so I'm the engagement lead from Grant Thornton, who are the Trust's external auditors. So in my session, uh, there's two aspects to this. Uh, and those of you who may have been at the uh, annual general meeting last year may be familiar with the, the first half. So I thought it'd be useful just to talk through a little bit around the work that we deliver in external audit in the NHS. And then in the second part of the uh, presentation, to talk through some of the key messages from our review of the accounts uh, and also the work that we do around the use of resources or what's known as the value for money arrangements conclusion. We ordinarily uh, have a third element to our audit work which is to review the quality report and uh, a sample of the key performance indicators within that which I know is really impressed to the governors uh, but unfortunately that piece of work didn't happen this year uh, as a result of Covid uh, and obviously it was felt that you know, it wasn't the best use of resources for auditors and uh, indeed clinicians to be uh, digging around in terms of medical records during uh, March and, and April. So that piece of work uh, was cancelled for 1920. Move to the next slide please Vicky, thank you. So in terms of the key role of external audit, uh, well ultimately it's to provide that independent assurance to you as, as governors, as members, uh, to give an opinion on the trust accounts to make sure the income expenditure uh, is appropriately recorded and the valuation of your assets and liabilities. And then again, we have a, a secondary uh, requirement in public sector audit, which is to report to you if we feel that the organisation doesn't have appropriate arrangements in place for use of resources or value for money. In addition to that, um, auditors in the public sector do have special reporting powers. Uh, we can make a referral to, to NHS uh, IE, uh, or we can issue a report in the public interest uh, if we felt there was something inappropriate uh, that was taking place at uh, an organisation. Just to be very clear, uh, we've not issued either of those uh, for Airedale uh, this year. They are very rare, uh, particularly in the NHS, although recently 
uh, we as a firm did issue one uh, as a council in the Midlands. Uh, next slide, please, Richie. So in addition to that, we're also required to uh, perform any work that's mandated by NHSIE or CQC. Again, typically that is mainly in relation to the work on the quality report. Um, but unfortunately, that, that wasn't required this year. Uh, and we're also required to review the trust's annual report and annual governance statement to make sure that, that uh, the content of those key uh, external documents are consistent with our understanding and knowledge of the trust. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm, I'm very much uh, passionate in terms of ensuring that our relationship with, with our audit clients is one that's on a 12 month basis throughout the year. Um, so certainly I have a, a regular level of, of liaison with Amy and Amy's senior team uh, throughout the year. Uh, we typically uh, will meet to kick off our planning in, in the autumn. Uh, we issue our audit plan early in the new year uh, to the audit committee. Uh, we then perform an interim audit typically around February, March time uh, and report that to the audit committee. And then normally our audit uh, process is focused on the period from late April to May. But as a result of COVID, uh, the audit deadline was extended this year by about three and a half weeks uh, to, to the end of the third week of June uh, when we issued our audit opinion. And then after that, we always have a, a debrief with Amy and her team in terms of what went well on the audit, what perhaps we could do more efficiently and effectively in the following year. Thank you. I think it's important to know who considers our work. So I guess our primary relationship is with the, the audit committee. So they consider all our progress reports throughout the year, our audit plan and our year end ISA 260 report. It also considers our performance. Uh, are we delivering uh, you know, a high quality, robust, independent audit process? Uh, and we also confirm our independence to the audit committee. So obviously that's very key, uh, something uh, you know, in the public eye at the moment, making sure that auditors are genuinely independent and can give that independent view uh, on an auditing body. The board obviously approves the audited accounts. It would act on any key recommendations that we, uh, that we make. And it would have to consider whether we delivered any non-audit work. And again, just to be very clear, uh, we haven't delivered any uh, non-audit or might see as consultancy type uh, work at Airdale this year or indeed in previous years. As a council of governors, obviously they've got a very important job from, from my perspective, which is to appoint or uh, should I have a big remove the external auditor, a uh, very key role for, for the governors on that. Clearly, if during the course of my audit, I felt that management or the board uh, weren't responding appropriately to any concerns that I had, I would escalate that up to the Council of Governors. Again, just to be very clear, that's not, not occurred at, at Airdale this year. And ultimately, they would have to approve any non-audit work uh, if, we, if we were to do any, obviously, if we've not done any at, uh, at Airdale. And then finally, in terms of the regulator, NHSIE, they uh, receive all copies of our key reports and opinions. Ordinarily, they would receive our report on the, on the quality report. But that's not occurred this year and they would receive any public interest reports, but again, not, not something that we've done at Airdale or elsewhere. Thank you. So that was a summary of, of, of the work that we do in external law. In the next couple of slides, just draw attention to some of the key findings from our 1920 audit that we concluded back uh, at the end of June. So in terms of the accounts audit, I suppose the key thing to mention, I think Amy touched on it in her slide as well, was that we gave uh, an unqualified clean audit opinion. So that's the audit opinion that, that Amy as a finance director and the trust would, would want. I mean, in that, you know, I was satisfied that the accounts gave a, a true and fair view and there were no material errors within those accounts. Uh, the working papers provided by Amy's team were of a good standard and certainly my team and Amy's team, they have regular meetings uh, during the key uh, parts of our audit, during the interim audit in the spring and then again in, in May and June, uh, there was regular meetings all done remotely this year because we, we audited off-site which was a new experience for us all uh, but the use of technology uh, and the availability of Amy's teams meant, meant that uh, you know that didn't de detrimentally uh, impact on, on the audit. There were no major weaknesses in terms of financial systems uh, that we reviewed and there were no audit adjustments on the draft numbers that, that Amy reported in the draft account so that's, that's a key finding as well that uh, the draft numbers that Amy reported against uh, budget against the control total, there were no changes uh, arising from our audit review. 
on the loss. We did make a small number of fairly minor presentational changes. They're fairly typical, uh, you know, of, of, of an audit of this nature. I guess the key areas where our uh, audit focus uh, was on was around the valuation of the trust estate, the valuation of land and buildings. And this year, as a result of the COVID pandemic, uh, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, or RICS, who were effectively the, the, the guardians of the, the value, uh, valuation uh, specialists that the trust use, they issued guidance this year to say that there was an uncertainty around the valuation of land and buildings as a result of the impact of the pandemic. Um, so they drew attention to that in their report, and we also drew attention to that in, in our audit opinion. Again, that wasn't something unique to Airedale, that was something consistent across uh, all NHS uh, trust bodies. And the other area that we focus on, uh, again, Amy touched on this before, uh, is around the contracts with Yorkshire Commissioners, with NHS England, to make sure that the trust is recognising uh, the appropriate level of income in your accounts. Okay. So the second area where we look at in external audit alongside the accounts is the, the value for money uh, arrangements conclusion. Uh, so this is where we look at how the trust uses the resources uh, that it's been allocated and make sure that it's got appropriate arrangements in place to uh, deliver those resources. Again, we, we issued an unqualified clean value for money conclusion. Uh, that's a good outcome for the trust. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing uh, qualified uh, value for money conclusions in the NHS trust provider sector. So the fact that Airedale uh, was issued with a, with a clean opinion from myself on this is a, is a positive thing. Uh, some of the key findings we noted there, there was a, a level of underperformance against the control total, but was mainly due to the uh, anticipated support that the, that the ICS uh, was going to provide the trust that that didn't come through in full. However, the trust did still deliver uh, an overall surplus of, of 1.4 million and it delivered its uh, savings programme, apologies for the use of jargon there, so the cost improvement programme, the CIP, just over 6 million was delivered in full, uh, which a high proportion of that would be currently, so again that was good performance. Clearly, um, you know, ongoing challenges remain, but for Airedale, as indeed it, 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 they do for all NHS organisations around the ongoing financial challenges, the savings delivery, the sort of integration and collaboration within that, uh, the, the ICS regime around some of the financial uh, support within that. Um, it's going to be an unusual year for audit in 2021, I think it's fair to say. Amy and I were just chatting about that before uh, the meeting started. So obviously the trust has been funded centrally, effectively on a break-even basis for the first six months of the year. And then for the second six months of the year, that's going to be heavily linked to the performance of of the ICS, as, as Brendan mentioned uh, earlier in his session. So again, we'll be, you know, having regular uh, dialogue with, with Amy uh, and her team around that. Um, and we've got a, a call uh, in the diary in a couple of weeks' time to, to kickstart some of those discussions. Thank you. So that was it from me. Um, hopefully that was helpful in terms of a bit around you know, the work that we do in the NHS and then some key messages in terms of our audit findings for 1920. Uh, obviously happy to take any any questions that, that members may have and thank you very much for listening. So that concludes the formal business of the annual members meeting. We're just looking to see if there are any questions members at this point. There's nothing appearing in the chat facility at the moment. I will give just a little bit longer because in case people have got the questions they want to raise. OK. Well, th thank you for, as I say, concluding the formal part of the annual members meeting. It seemed remiss when we have um, members present to not have the opportunity to have a conversation about how things have moved on since 31st of March 2020. And so the next session is all about the impact of COVID-19 and how we're restarting our services. So I'll hand over to colleagues to take us through that next session on the agenda. 
Okay, thank you, Andrew. I think I'm first. It was just a couple of slides to go through some of the changes that we're going to be seeing around, or are seeing, um, around the financial regime. Um, obviously, due to COVID pandemic, there's been a lot of changes um, over the last six months, and there's continues to be changes into the next six months about how the financial regime will work. So originally, um, we um, pre-COVID, uh, we set a plan that assumed we would still continue to deliver surpluses um, into this financial year of 410,000. Those did include an efficiency ask of about 11.6 million, so we were expected to make savings of about 5.9%. Um, we, we were aware that this wouldn't be deliverable in one year, and we were expecting that to be supported by our, and again, apologies for jargon here, through our place, which is our Bradford and Airedale partners, and also at ICS level, which is our West Yorkshire partners, and that was agreed um, in order to get us to do a 410,000 surplus. However, um, since COVID, the financial regime has changed a lot, um, and the national expectation now is that all systems should balance. Um, and what happens at the moment is we are all on a block contract. This is across the NHS. Um, which means we get a set amount of money each month um, and if that isn't sufficient we then get a top up at the end of the month which enables us to bring back to balance. Clearly um, that position is audited to check that we are spending money um, in, in the right way um, and that we are providing value for money services. Um, so next slide please Kate. Um, so that's where we've been for the first six months um, and we've had all our income recovered. So we are we are in a balanced position for the first six months of the financial year. Going forward, it's still remaining quite unclear. Um, we've just started to receive what we believe will be our financial envelope for months seven to 12, so October through to March. Um, and we're expecting again a similar position that we'd be expected to come back to financial balance. Um, but that will be delivered more at a system level, so at a West Yorkshire level than it has been this financial, like the last financial year, sorry. But what we do want to state is that um, regardless of the financial regime, um, the board as a whole will be committed to ensuring that any short term financial decision making does not lead to any unexpected long term challenges, i.e. we make decisions that are fit for this year's financial regime and do not lead us to problems in future years and that we deliver any efficiency improvements that we need to, to ensure that we remain a sustainable foundation trust going forwards. Just before we start the uh, next session about um, impact of COVID-19, there have actually been a couple of questions that have come into the chat facility. So I think it's appropriate as they relate to finance and audit that Amy and Gareth address those questions before we move on in the agenda. So um, in fact, there's a third question come in as well. So can Amy and Gareth see those questions? Or would you like us to read, read them. them out? OK, we're just, we're just looking at them, Andrew. Read them. So the first question for um, people who haven't got access to these is, is it possible to measure value for health and not money in the audit? Gareth, I think that's appropriate for you to reply. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess where we do um, take into account in our value for money conclusion, uh, the, the, I suppose the, the performance of the, an organisation's health delivery is where, uh, you know, if the CQC had uh, rated a particular organisation inadequate, that would potentially, well, it would probably lead to a qualification of the of the value for money conclusion on the basis that the organisation wasn't providing adequate uh, healthcare for its community in the financial envelope that it's been awarded. Um, so we do take into account the work of other regulators who are. Uh, perhaps looking at the performance of an organisation other than its financial performance. Um, so, for example, you know, at Airedale, we have had discussions as part of our BFM work around the trust response to, um, you know, the requires improvements you can see with you from a couple of years ago. And we took into account the fact that, um, you know, the trust received a good 
uh, report around the new resources and the you know, uh, elements that are more recent to be seen with you. So we, 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 do, we do take that into account in our work, but and obviously our focus is, is on the you know the audit requirements for the uh, for the national audit offices audit for the public sector. That response. So the next question, which I ask Amy, is, is how does the cost of the audit compare with the cost of nurses' pay? So that's that's an interesting question. So um, in terms of overall, it would be a very small proportion of what we pay to our nurses and our clinical staff. Um, what we do do to give some assurance around our audit costs is we do benchmark them. Um, and uh, test that they um, are comparable to other organisations of similar sizes. Um, we also um, do go out to tender on a frequent basis to ensure that we are getting value for money in our audit area. Um, in terms of, I mean, actually comparing it to a individual nurse's pay would be challenging because that, that varies considerably. Um, I suppose that's the response I'd give on that. Is it anything you want to add, Gareth? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, I, I probably refer to a, a recent report that came out just last week, which was a report called the Redmond Review. Um, it was mainly around the state of the public sector audit market and local authorities, but it equally applied to the AHS audit market. And essentially, that was highlighting there some of the challenges of the uh, delivery of public sector audits in terms of you know feed pressures have uh, been on a downward trend at the same time that you know um, the regulatory requirements and the pressures around audit quality have been going in the other direction. Um, added to that, you know there is a, a real challenge of experience of public sector auditors or lack of at the minute. Um, so I suppose it's you'd expect me to defend the. the Public sector audit fee market, um, but the, the, you know I think our fees are are competitive here at, at, at Airedale, um, instead of being subject to uh, a tender process. I think you know the, the direct of travel for the audit fees in the coming years, I suspect, is upwards, uh, not just at GT but across the board, um, to take into account the sort of the increased challenges and expectations around stakeholders such as yourself and members to make sure that we've got that. We've got stored it in place that can deliver you know, detailed and comprehensive audits to, to provide that assurance of the taxpayer's money effectively. So just to re-emphasise on that particular response, something that was in your slides as well, Gareth, that the appointment of auditors is a council of governors led appointment and it, it is tendered every three years. I think also it's important that the trust has a robust audit process be assured that the finances and the quality reports that we report to members are appropriate and accurate. I think it's also just, I'm not, as the question has been raised anonymously, it's also worth emphasising that the cost of the audit is explicitly disclosed in the trust annual report and account. So I think moving on, the next question is, does car parking make a profit? Amy. So um, any income that we recover from our car parking does go back into reinvesting in our services or in our estate. Over the last couple of years, we've made significant investment, particularly into car parking. So you'll have seen in 2019-20, um, that was 800,000. Um, I think what I also want to add here is at the moment, we, aren't, we are not charging for car parking. So it's free to both staff and patients. Um, as we currently stand. So at the moment, um, in this financial year, um, we're not making any income from car parking. Thank you for that response. So let's move on to the next item on the agenda, which is Jerry Stanford on the report on the work of the Council of Governors. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the public governor for Pendle East and Cone. And this uh, slide before you now shows your Council of Governors, and you can see this on our website if you want to get more detail. The Council is made up of 12 publicly elected governors, four governors drawn from local councils, 
and voluntary services and four governors representing the hospital staff. Having governors from these different backgrounds means we have a good mix of experience, which helps us in our holding to account duties. Last year, we undertook governor elections for Bingley Rural, where Peter Home was elected, the Staff Allied Health Professionals and Science, Scientists constituency, where Annette Ferrier was re-elected, whilst for Settle and Mid Craven, rest of England, and the staff doctors and dentists constituencies, there were no nominations. We will be encouraging members in those constituencies to put their names forward when we undertake elections in 2021. There will also be elections in my own constituency, Pendle East and Cone, our two Keithley constituencies and our all other staff constituency. If you want to find out more about these roles, please get in touch in the first instance with our membership office at the Trust. The next two slides show uh, an overview of the work that your council have uh, conducted in the 12 months to March. Amongst others, we've again been involved in meetings with governors from other establishments within the West Yorkshire and Harrogate partnership. Sadly, there were fewer events for members this year a thing we hope to improve on with our new trust governance team once things return to normal. Member feedback on the talks, including your idea on new topics, helps us to plan our future programme of events. So if you have ideas, please let us know later. Once again, we've held a very successful and well attended theatres open day, a source of much public feedback. Our members have again helped us by giving us their views on the trust's annual plan for the years ahead and the issues that concern them. An annual feedback report, a summary of your comments and concerns in fact, was shared with the board. And I'm pleased to tell you that the board has acted on those issues. So this next set of slides highlight the representative representativeness of our membership. It's catching Brendan. In parts of this presentation, I'm going to compare our membership figures with those of the whole district taken from the last census data. That's not as up to date as we would have liked them to be. At the 31st of March 2020, we had 10,915 public members, about 170 fewer than last year. We are working to recruit more members and again, we need your help, please. Our membership strategy contains an objective to develop the representativeness of the membership. And this slide shows that representation in terms of ethnicity. Here are the numbers behind the colours. 8,471 members describe themselves as white. That's 78% of our total membership. Whilst within the district, 90% describe themselves as white. 76 are of mixed race, less than 1% against a district average of 1%. 1,012 as Asian or Asian British, that's 9% against a district average of only 2%. 63 is black or black British, that's just under 1%. The district average is less than 0.5%. 22 are described as another ethnic group, that's just under 1%, whereas the district average is less than 0.5. And we don't have the ethnicity details of 1,268 members, 12%. So our ethnicity data shows that we're broadly representative of the population. In terms of age, we invite people to become members from the age of 14. And whilst we only have five members in that age bracket, our younger members, 14 to 21, total 383. Majority of our members are in the 22 to 29 and the 60 plus age brackets. And there's a fairly even distribution between the ages of 30 and 59. In the district, the majority of people, 19%, are aged 60 to 74, which is a similar picture. There's a relatively even split 
across the district in the other age groups, with those people in the 22 to 29 age group, that's 8%, in the minority. So in terms of age, we do differ a bit when compared to the district. In terms of gender, the majority of our members are female, 64%. We asked a small number of members, 29, have not told us their gender. From the data available to us regarding gender base in the district, there's a relatively even split between male, 49, and female, 51%. And the next slide shows the number of members living, or in the case of staff working, in our different constituency areas as of the 31st of March. As you can see, most of our members live in Keithley, Skipton and rest of England. The latter being any area not within the constituency areas stipulated in the table. Earlier this year, we agreed that our membership strategy should be integrated with the trust-wide engagement strategy. And this slide sets out our priorities. Our membership priorities within that strategy are detailed and focus on the membership representative of the area, recruitment of people that have an interest in healthcare to become members of the trust, engaging the membership about the trust's plans and services, and to ensure we engage in an effective way. We've developed a plan of acti activities in support of these priorities and will resume as many activities as soon as possible. This slide shows graphically how the information that we get from you circulates and flows through the governor process. My final slide shows how we have managed to continue our work since lockdown in March. We had to adapt to the new normal to maintain our role and we're grateful to the Trust in supporting us in this endeavour. This is how we've maintained our duties. We appeal to members to also adapt by contacting their governors by email or telephone to keep feedback coming in. The email address for governors is on the website on the Council of Governors Who's Who page. Finally, as this is my last duty as your lead governor, I thank you, the members, and the governors themselves for the support you've all given me in the last two years. Please support Dr. Karen Ellison in the same way as she takes over from me today. I should be up for re-election next spring, so I hope to continue my work for the Trust. Thank you. OK, again, just have a little pause to see if any questions come in. Whilst we're doing that, on behalf of the board and as Chair of Council of Governors, I would like to thank Jerry for his two years as lead governor, his unstinting commitment through that. And whilst he remains a governor and he will be there in the background to support the governor's team, as Jerry has indicated, it, Karen Ellison will take over as lead governor from the conclusion of this meeting. So welcome, Karen, to your duties, which members will see, I guess, at this presentation this time next year. Yeah. So questions, there doesn't appear to be any coming in. So on that basis, I think we'll move on. If there are some that do come in, we can pick them up in the broader question and answer session. But if not, we'll now move to the agenda item, the impact of COVID-19 and restarting our services. Good afternoon, David Crampsey, Medical Director. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to discuss shortly the exceptional response that we've seen from our teams and indeed from our community, but it felt appropriate to discuss the impact and the exceptional ask that was given to us all in the last few weeks and in fact continues to be given. So what was that impact? Well, our communities were locked down. We live in those communities. We are those communities. Our hospital sits in that community. We also asked our extremely clinically vulnerable patients and staff to be identified, to shield, and actually to undertake the isolation which was required to protect them from this virus. We saw during the period, particularly from late March until June, a surge in our hospital admissions a massive increase in the number of patients needing critical care and ventilatory support and tragically we also saw deaths. 
We had to put in place restrictions on our visiting and tied into that whilst we reduced footfall in the hospital to maintain safety of all. We also had to ask a number of colleagues to work from home who would be used to coming and bring, coming together as teams in the organisation. As Rob will describe later, we also had to cease some planned care activity and that was paused for again a period of about three months and Rob will describe in detail with Stuart the recovery plans that we've got in place and already implementing. I think we also need to call out and recognise the personal sacrifices that many of our staff made to maintain services. We had staff who chose to live away from home for a period to make sure that they could continue to provide that care for our patients as they were coming into the hospital. And as you'll see from pictures in the media, we also had staff wearing full personal protective equipment, which was unlike any that any has had to wear in the past, with bulky respirator units with full gowns on, masks, etc. And as you'll also be aware, some of that coincided with some of the unseasonably hot weather we had in those early months of the pandemic. I think what we're also recognising is the psychological impact on all of us in relation to the pandemic response but particularly for those individuals who were directly involved in that patient facing care. We also know the psychological impact that there has been in our communities for all of us. And that ties into the next point that I would like to make, which is that we did see for a period across our health and care system, fewer patients seeking medical attention. And some of our efforts have absolutely been focused on encouraging those patients to access services wherever those services are and not to sit at home with symptoms and concerns that are worrying them. We are open for business, our primary care colleagues are open for business and again that forms part of our reset planning. And on that note I'll hand over to Rob who will describe that in more detail. Thanks David. Uh, good afternoon everyone, I'm Rob Aitchison, I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the hospital. Uh, I think it's just worth saying, you know, like, like all of us here, I'm really proud to have worked alongside both our clinical and our non-clinical teams in responding to what we've experienced over the last six months. Uh, we're very much still in it uh, and it, you know, it's, it's a testament to those teams that people continue to work uh, to respond in whatever way is needed. So the, the list that I'm just going to talk through here is not exhaustive but I hope it gives a flavour of some of the things that we've been doing in response to, to what we've experienced. So I think the first point in terms of reconfiguration of our ward base but not just our ward base the whole of our hospital and how it operates and I think what that has needed is a real consideration about how we use our estate, our physical estate here on the Airedale site at Steeton but also the other uh, environments where we provide care from in the best way possible to keep our patients and our staff safe. One of the things that has involved is creating home cold zones in the hospital and I think it's testament to our colleagues within AGH Solutions who've worked shoulder by shoulder with us in finding creative ways of, of managing this in the best way possible. So uh, if you come into the Airedale site today you'll notice some very subtle changes uh, down to having things to walk on as you go down the corridor to separate yourselves uh, and, and maintain that social distancing. So there's a massive effort that, that's taken place there. As part of that, our critical care team have been a really crucial part of, of our response to this. And part of our response uh, at the peak of this that we experienced throughout April was creating an additional capacity within our theatre unit. So obviously we stopped doing a lot of our planned work but continue to do some of it and we recreated additional capacity pulling teams from other areas to support the effort that was needed. I think there's an important point to make about those teams that might not have been in those traditional categories of trying to deal with the kind of hot COVID patients. And I think one of the teams that needs to be called out, and it's a great example, is our orthopaedic team. So whilst we ceased some of our planned orthopaedic work throughout the, uh, the six months that we've seen, our orthopaedic team were, were right there with us providing minor injuries unit care to patients coming through A&E. So what we were able to do is segregate some of the care that we're providing at the front door. And that team we utilised and worked uh, tirelessly to provide care to patients who came through the A&E front door of the hospital. So it's a big thank you to them. I think equally our pathology team have, have had a huge amount of work to do and a massive effort from them during the last six months. I think some of the figures that really kind of knock your socks off really, I think since Covid came and you know it's a very new thing for us even in March, they managed to install equipment on the site and implement that equipment and testing capability within three weeks. And since they did that at the end of March, they processed 45,000 tests for patients, staff and others who needed that COVID test. So it's a massive testament to them and the, the ongoing importance of the role that they'll play as we move forward in the coming months and years. 
So um, I think big well done to them. I think to call out our research and development team as well, I think um, a big effort, a team that sometimes uh, is kind of, you know, sits in the background a little bit, but they've played a really key role in driving some really innovative work here and taking part in some of those national trials and leading them, the response within the hospital and outside of it. So again, big effort from them. In terms of outpatients, uh, as David talked about at the beginning, we, we ceased a large amount of routine work, but thanks to the technology that we were able to deploy, and the engagement of our patients, we continue to engage with a, a large proportion of our patients throughout this. So at its peak, we were uh, undertaking 8,000 virtual appointments a month, which allowed contact to be maintained with patients and some of those discussions that, that were needed with them. So again, thank you to, that, to the team there for, for all they've been doing. I think we've just given a flavour here of some of the other work that's been taking place. Again, some of it in the hospital and probably less visible to the public. But our clinical teams in particular have really stepped up and they've processed a huge amount of information, they've contributed to guidance and interpreted it for the benefit of our patients. So the clinical reference group that we implemented at the beginning of this, this uh, pandemic has played a really key role in making sure that we're clinically led and able to respond in the best way. Again, it's, it's worth just singling out our infection prevention and control team. It's a very small team, but it's a really effective team in the response. And clearly, like all of us, they've never experienced anything like this before. And the response has been fantastic in keeping our staff and our patients safe. And again, it's probably just worth calling out the different way that all of us have been working throughout this. So the use of MS Teams, for those of you that are not familiar, that's Microsoft Teams. It's, been one of the key things that the NHS has used across West Yorkshire and the country to make sure that we can continue communicating with each other inside and outside of the hospital actually whilst maintaining social distancing and making sure we minimise the spread of COVID uh, within our workforce. And then it's just worth also calling out the, the support that the Trust gave in a personal and a trust capacity to the Yorkshire and Humber Nightingale facility. So we have senior leadership uh, through Amanda who's sat here next to me and we'll talk to you shortly. Uh, playing into the design and the implementation of that in a very, very short amount of time. And also we had our AGH Solutions colleagues again, uh, really cre credit to them providing that soft facilities management, basically some of the state support people that needed to, to run the facility uh, under the banner of, of Airedale. So that's fantastic for the trust and for them to be doing that. Okay, so I'm just going to move on now to the next slide and I think it's, it's important also just to kind of call out a couple of a bits of detail really and things that we continue during COVID. And later on in the presentation, uh, my colleague Stuart Shaw, Director of Strategy, will talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing to reset our services. So I think throughout the pandemic, we did continue urgent and cancer surgery and treatment within the hospital. This was at a reduced level to what we would normally provide. So obviously alongside this, we're providing lots of planned uh, care but we managed to maintain treatment for a, a large proportion of our patients. In a small number of cases, I think there were lots of clinical conversations with those patients and a risk-based uh, conversation that took place with the patients to determine whether or not they should have their treatment or whether it should be paused for a period of time. I think it's also worth saying, as I've talked about before, the role of our minor injuries unit in supporting our emergency department in continuing to provide care for those people who were able to seek it out. And then similarly, we should call out the role of our inpatient services, our wards, you know, those wards providing hot and cold capacity and also the role of our community services team, who I think, again, it's some of it less visible, actually, as we've gone through this, but they've supported a huge proportion of patients in their own home and in care homes and other settings throughout this. So I think it's testament to them. We recommenced uh, a number of our services from the 29th of June, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get onto the reset part of our planning later on in the presentation. So I'm now going to hand you over to Joe Harrison, our Director of People, who will reflect on the important role our people continue to play in all that we do. Thanks Rob and hello everybody. Um, delighted to be with you today. I um, really want to talk to you about how we as an organisation really worked alongside our people, supporting and supporting our people. And the first thing really that um, we wanted to say, and it's a point that Brendan made earlier today, um, is around recognising and acknowledging the exceptional response that our people played in this COVID response. Um, they were absolutely phenomenal. As Rob says, we've been extremely proud to be working alongside um, those people doing that amazing work day in, day out. 
one of the most important things and ways in which we supported our, our colleagues was supporting people's health and well-being. So one of the first things that we did as part of the COVID response was establish staff well-being support early. That included the implementation of wobble rooms. So these were safe spaces that were available in some of our hottest zones, if you like, where we were caring for the extremely sick patients and giving them a safe space to go to um, and get support if needed. We also implemented psychological support for our staff and also issued care packs to colleagues and we did that from early April and that was really important around supporting people to stay hydrated and um, looking after themselves but also looking after each other. It was a really important part of our response. Communication was also really important in, and that was around ensuring our people were maintained and kept up to date with the new guidance that was emerging on a regular basis. But it was also around connecting with our people, whether they were on site, whether they were working from home or whether they were shielding. That was a really important part of our response. We did this through digital technology in the main, so um, virtual team briefings, frequently asked questions documents, colleague and manager guidance. We had lots and lots of dialogue with our people to understand what was really important to them at this, at this important time. As you can imagine, recruitment and training was, was also part of our response. So our local community response to our recruitment campaigns was absolutely phenomenal and personally want to thank you for engaging with our organisation on that basis. In the first two months of COVID, we made over 300 employment offers to people um, and, and that was just in the first two months. So, so thank you for your support in that. We also engaged with the National Bringing Back Staff campaign as well, which was um, around how we supported individuals returning back into the NHS who might have, have left previously. Training was developed and this was very much around making sure that we were able to support colleagues develop their skills um, get new skills to make sure that they were able to maintain those skills now and into the future. Um, and, and this was really about making sure that we were able to provide high quality care to our patients fundamentally. Uh, we had a sustained focus on protecting our people. So we rigorously monitored, maintained a consistent supply um, and quality of personal protective equipment. That was absolutely essential part to keeping our people safe and uh, enabling them to feel confident in providing that high quality care to our patients. Staff testing was a, a key part of our response also. So this was symptomatic testing for colleagues and family members who were symptomatic, as well as antibody testing um, as part of the research and the national views um, that were part of that. Um, we also focused um, around a risk reduction framework. So we, we, had, we layered this up at organisational level, at department level, and at individual level. And this really links to the inclusion work that Brendan was talking about earlier. So we very quickly identified who were our vulnerable groups that were at, more, at higher risk of more severe illness. Um, and we identified those early and worked with them to make sure they were able to um, feel safe and feel confident in the workspace or at home if that was where they needed to be. We implemented a command and control structure. We did that rapidly and this continues to be in place. Um, clinical leadership was a critical part of that work and we provided that clinical leadership through the clinical reference group as well as creating agile structures for us to really make sure that we were able to make multi-professional decisions rapidly and at pace where we needed to make them. Digital connectivity and support was a key part of that, so hence how we are communicating with you today as our members. But the provision of equipment and support systems to enable our people to work remotely and maintain communication and patient consultations was also incredibly important. So we've actually supported over 700 of our, our, our people to work on site and off site and in an agile way. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Amanda Stanford to talk to you about our patient response. Thank you. Good afternoon everybody. As Jo said, my name is Amanda Stanford and I'm the Director of Patient Safety and Quality here in Sherdale. I just wanted to share with you some of the ways in which we cared for patients in an environment that was unprecedented really. Um, the majority of us will recognise that actually when our family members come into hospital, when our loved ones come into hospital, we're very much part of that usually. We're able to come on site, we're able to be part of that healthcare journey. 
during COVID, all of that stopped and our patient experience was very different. One of our underpinning principles here at Erda is to make sure that we provide safe and compassionate care. And our teams, so when I talk about our teams, I don't just mean the clinical teams, it was all of our teams across the organisation had to find different ways of making sure that our patients and our families kept in touch. And I just want to share some examples. And this list is by no way exhaustive. There were lots of examples across the organisation where our staff went over and above making sure that families were engaged and, and they were able to keep in touch. Some of the ways we did that was really through our virtual visiting. So we used technology to try and make sure that our family members could see and speak to patients that were in, particularly where they were in uh, critical care. These were stressful times for family members when you can't see, when you can't touch your loved ones. So actually just being able to see them and talk to them meant a great deal. And equally, this was really important to our staff because actually visiting is a fundamental part of that journey. And I think staff found it very challenging not to be able to interact with family members, so it helped them too. And um, part of our basic human needs is being able to touch and hug. And our teams came up with an idea around uh, virtual hugs. So what this meant is that family members could send in a request to either send a card or a message or a poem and our teams here would take that along to patients to make sure that they got those messages in a timely way. Um, because family members, carers, friends couldn't come on site and, and bring things in, we set up a service here for care packages so we had on site things just basic things like toothbrushes, toothpaste, a magazine, some sweets and a request could go in from families and the uh, teams here would then have one of those care packages and deliver them to the patient. Um, equally, if families wanted to bring something in, they could bring a parcel in, they could arrange with the team to drop it off at a, a, and, and they'd be given a time slot to do that and then the team here would drop that parcel off. One of the important things for us as a team was whilst nationally uh, the complaints process was suspended, we felt that it was really important that if concerns and complaints or any feedback came in that we still had sight of that because actually during that heightened period there may have been things that we needed to respond to in the moment. So the quality and safety team maintained oversight of any concerns, complaints or feedback coming in and where we felt it was really um, important that we would respond to those complaints and that we wouldn't suspend them until post-COVID. When we did suspend them, we communicated well with those complainants and explained the situation. And we're now starting to put back into place our complaints response. The other bit for me is making sure, and you'll have heard this from both Joe and Rob and, and David, is around safety. And really, we were incredibly stringent around infection prevention and control for the safety of our patients and for the safety of people coming on site where it was necessary. So we maintain the highest standards of infection prevention and control. And you'll have heard from Rob earlier about how we reorganised our hospital to make sure that patient flows were, were maintained and that all patients were kept as safe as possible. And that was just a flavour and as I said, the important thing was that staff were coming up with ideas to make sure that our patients felt cared for in such a strange and unusual time. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Stuart to talk about how we're now resetting. Afternoon everyone, uh, my name is Stuart Shaw, I'm the uh, Director of Strategy and Planning. Um, so back at the end of April, uh, we began the process of planning for how we were going to uh, reset and restart uh, all of the services that we provide in the organisation and it might seem a bit strange that I talk about we did that way back uh, at the end of April um, but given the amount of work that has to take uh, place at every step to actually be able to gradually just reintroduce and re-implement services we, uh, we had to do quite a lot of preparatory work up front to get to a point where as and when the, the level of COVID cases in the organisation gradually started to reduce, uh, we were able to start and put some of those plans in place. Um, it, it's fair to say that the amount of work involved in resetting things was and continues to be a significant ask 
uh, for all of our teams and divisions involved. Uh, and the way that we've gone about approaching that work is set out on, the, on this slide. Um, so first and foremost, we, we, we started with a, with a view where we should plan quite hard for the triple effect, uh, what we're calling on here, an increase in work, particularly around emergency work, together with a, a high demand for winter just around the corner, including seasonal flu and the potential COVID surge. And, and as society has gradually been reintroduced, uh, to, to an element of normality, not, not complete normality. We believe it best to plan hard uh, for, the, for that actual uh, particular level of demand of services uh, materialising. So you can see that on the slide there, the way we've gone about it is to actually almost plan for it being 110% of the level of demand that we experienced in the previous year. That's really important to do in primacy first and foremost because actually just building on what Rob said a few minutes ago, how we actually would go about configuring the hospital and running it, um, it is based on the level of demand, first of all, as we expect to see through the front door. So that all of our plans have developed with that up front, and we've worked hard over the last few weeks with our teams to work on how we would configure the beds, how we would configure the staffing around that, and be able to absorb that level of demand to a point. But we then also really start to address how we would look at some of the other priorities that we set out. So those include things like ring fencing capacity and, support and infrastructure for priority patients such as those who have cancer, but also looking at where we would maximise some of the what we call planned care opportunities. So we worked hard towards reopening capacity of the trust in particular things like operating theatres and our outpatients work both virtually and some face to face where it was required as well as the reintroduction of some of our diagnostic service provision. And that is, is, is activity that we've been looking to provide both here at the Trust and also outside. So working across that place and across that system that you heard referenced earlier on, Bradford District and Craven, and even across West Yorkshire. And what we're trying to do there is to balance off the demands that we expect are going to materialise over the next few months, as well as actually starting to reintroduce as many services gradually and incrementally uh, as it's possible to do so. I say that and, and, but, but at the same time we must continue to ensure that whilst we address the population need we are also ensuring we are adhering to all of the national guidance. So you will see reference on there to infection prevention and control and you will have heard my colleagues talk, talk a few minutes ago about some of the very specific rules and regulations that we have to adhere to. At all times, safety is paramount. And whatever we're, we're considering the resetting and restarting of the service, um, we've looked at that guidance and seen what the impact would be before we start to consider as and when we could reintroduce that service. The other, the other bit to say is that underpinning all of this is a very detailed workforce plan. We recognise there are some challenges within that. So anything that we, we are looking to do at the moment will not only be underpinned by ensuring we have the appropriate level of resource that we are expecting to see, but also the infrastructure, staffing and otherwise, to be able to, to reintroduce it. And of course, all of this is subject to us not having another surge of COVID um, as, as we all as a nation continue to watch uh, what happens. Uh, if you just move the slide on, I think it just to, by the way, we finish off from all of us here, is to say that we have received a significant amount of support uh, throughout this whole period from, uh, uh, from, from our communities, from our patients uh, and our staff have received that and I'm really grateful for, uh, for the level of public and community support we have received. So from all of us here, it's a collective thank you. Okay, so that concludes the formal presentations and the information that we wanted to share with you. Clearly we've said from the outset this is an annual members meeting. We want to engage with you and hear your views, questions and concerns. So feel free to type into the chat facility anything that you want to raise with us in this forum before the meeting closes. Since we've been having our conversation, the last conversation, there's been some feedback come in about the important role that governors have to play. I see that those comments are raised by Pauline Sharp, who indeed herself was for many years a stakeholder governor, so thank you Pauline and I think you're absolutely right in terms of the Trust website identifying who our each governor is, 
so that members of the public have the opportunity to contact the relevant company that represents them and can hear their views and then bring them forward to the trust. Thank you, Pauline, for, for raising that. Are there any other questions, comments, observations that people, members of the public, would like to raise? I know you're all be beavering away, um, typing in your points as we speak. We're going to get a flood, aren't we, in a minute? Very much appreciate you joining this annual members meeting this afternoon. It has obviously been undertaken in a slightly different circumstances to usual, um, but no less it's important that we share with you and hear from you as, as a trust and as a community. And um, yeah, the feedback that we welcome to be able to continue to serve the community in the way that the community well wants health and care provision in the future. So there's a question come in. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to stand up and read this. So a strategic question. In the past, Keith Lynn Craven operated a separate infectious disease site. Could this return? And I think that's a question for oh, Exactly. I, I don't think it will return, but I think, um, I, I, as Stuart alluded to, and it plays to my commentary about a new build, actually the way we operate hospital services is going to change for the long term. And as part of our conversations around what a new build would look like at the Steeton site, we've already been considering how do we manage that infection control agenda as stringently as both Amanda and Stuart called out. So what we would be looking at is what would the single room occupancy look like? We wouldn't necessarily have a separate hospital, um, but I think it speaks to the unprecedented times that we are all in. And as Rob called out, um, as a district, we supported the opening of the uh, Nightingale Hospital, hospital at Harrogate. Um, we may need to make rapid decisions about other facilities in the future, but as it stands for our long term planning, we would look at what would this facility look like and how could it accommodate different infectious control procedures. And I'm just, I'm so sorry because I realised the camera's over there as I was looking over there. I do apologise. I'm so sorry. Okay. So, another question What plans does the Trust have to manage a second spike in COVID 19? Rob, do you want to take this one? Yes, please. Uh, okay, yeah, so I, I think I absolutely would have expected someone to ask this question. So I think, I, I guess the, the, my main reflection would be there's still a lot of uncertainty, isn't there, in every part of our lives at the moment in terms of what's going to happen next. I think the way we've approached this today is the stewards reflected on the reset planning that we've been doing, and we have developed a series of triggers within the trust. So, there's a number of reasons I think why that is working quite well at the moment within the organisation. It helps us to communicate with our teams and to try to talk through some of that uncertainty and the things that we would do within each of those scenarios. To answer your question directly though, uh, we are planning at this moment to be operating on a mixed economy over winter, so we'll be absolutely getting started and increasing the volume of planned work we're doing in the hospital. Because whilst I think the demand for our services non-electively is very visible and very evident, Equally, we've got a proportion of the population who are waiting for things that are having detrimental effects or potentially have a detrimental effect on their health. So we're absolutely looking for a balance. In the same way that we managed this the first time around, though, when a certain number of triggers are met, we will take different actions within the hospital. So some of that may involve redeploying people to other areas and ceasing certain elements of our service. But I think the thing that we will have, uh, particularly from a learning perspective, is a really clear framework that we'll be working within. So at this present time, we've seen a slight increase in the number of COVID patients in the hospital. We start to see a little bit of an increase, but actually we have capacity, we're planned, we're configured in a way that will allow us to, to manage to care for that different range of patients. So I think great question, absolutely uh, the right thing is the question we're asking ourselves at the moment. Will it be challenging for our teams? It absolutely will. And I think the things that Joe in particular has talked about around how we support our workforce, and make sure we can keep them and support them to be as resilient as possible in what's been a really challenging year so far. So uh, I hope that's answered your question. Um, and yeah, absolutely, that's, that's the plan as it stands. Thank you. 
I, I think the take home message here is we remain battle ready and have been. And that, to Rob's point, that extends out to our community services. So whilst the hospital uh, saw a huge uh, increase in activity, so did our community colleagues. And I would say all of our teams have remained um, battle ready and remain so. OK, so just monitoring if there are any more questions. I'd love to hear from people who've taken the time and effort to log on and hear the presentations this afternoon. It'd be great if you've got questions. This is your opportunity to ask and as with the previous ones, get a response. Just whilst we're waiting for people avidly typing through there, I would like to thank all the governors for their work and their uh, commitment to the trust. They do that on a voluntary basis. And echoing something that Jerry uh, mentioned earlier, there are vacancies um, in Settle, there are vacancies in the rest of England, and there's also, as colleagues watch this at a later date when it's published on the Trump's website, there's the doctors and dentists stack of the post available. And it would be great to have a full complement of governors. So if you feel compelled to get involved, do so. Equally, watch out for the elections in spring 2021 when there will be seats um, up, up for election. Get involved if you want to. It's you know, a fabulous opportunity to not just in events like today, but to have an active participation in the trust and its day to day work. So I'm keeping an eye on the questions list, but I can't see any more. So having given field due an um, opportunity for that, I will formally draw the meeting to a close. Can I thank all colleagues who've been involved in their presentations this afternoon. Can I thank all board members and all board members have been um, participating in and observing this meeting. And I would also like to thank governors for their um, attendance this afternoon. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you members of the public who uh, spent the time to hear and also ask questions. I think it's important that we as a trust respond and serve the community. So we value that input. So thank you very much. I'll draw the meeting to a close. Keep well, keep safe. We hope to see you at the annual members meeting next year. Thank you.